Hello and welcome to Vintage Alternative. I'm Ryan Hamilton and I'm really excited to share my conversation with Toad the Wet Sprocket frontman Glenn Phillips. This is a really interesting chat. Toad the Wet Sprocket have a crazy story when it comes to how they found success and how they got signed. We talk about that. We talk about life in the 90s and all kinds of other fun stuff. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. Here's my chat with Glenn Phillips. Before people were using the term alternative or alternative radio was a thing, for me as a teenager in Texas, it was called college music. So me and all my friends, we thought we were cool because we were listening to college radio and it was cool if you knew the college bands. So this is my copy from, I think I got it in 1992. Nice. So when I first discovered you guys, it's because me and my friends were listening to college radio, pre-alternative, which a lot of people won't really realize wasn't a thing forever. Yeah, they were searching for a name for a long time. It felt like they were postmodern, postmodern, post-pop, college. So they were fishing until they just landed on alternative finally. Right. <laughs> when you see this, what comes to mind? What are some of the memories that kind of surface? Uh, well, the, I mean, the first thing I think when I see a cassette is just like, where's my pencil? Uh, just <laughs> so I can, you know, fix it. Um, I, had a, I had a shitty tape player, so it's, uh, that, that's, that's my first thought. Uh, you know, it, yeah, it's a long time ago, different era. Is it true, I have to ask, that All I Want almost didn't make that album? Yeah, I think we thought it was too pop. Um, I mean, what's funny about that is uh, Good Intentions was another one on that was recorded for Fear that we actually literally, like, Todd hated that song. And, and we were like, it's too pop, it's crap. Like, we didn't put it on the record because, once again, we thought we were an alternative band and not a pop band. So, uh, and that ended up being a, a big single from the Friends soundtrack later on. So, right. um, yeah, we were trying to be darker and more mysterious. And just to back up a little bit, another, I don't know if we'd consider it a rumor, but something I'd love to ask you about. I heard that somebody you didn't know at ASCAP or BMI, I'm not sure, found an old tape of yours and just started dubbing copies on their own and sending them out. Is that the way it went down? It's it's about 80% correct. Uh, so okay. we'd had, we'd, <laughs> we'd done Bread and Circus and we put that out in town. Uh, and even that record was almost accidental. Uh, we had a, a friend and later co-manager, Brad Knack, who was a local musician, and he wanted a backup band for two songs. And he paid us by letting us record two songs. You know, it was his home, it was uh, called Camp David. It was in a tract home in Thousand Oaks. We recorded two songs live in the studio and we were like, that's easy. If we do eight more, we'll have a record. And so we came back in and spent 600 bucks and did eight more songs and that was Bread and Circus. Um, and then when we started on uh, the Pale album, that we did down in Los Angeles with Paul DeGray recording it and Marvin Etzioni uh, producing it. And Marvin's manager worked at ASCAP, a guy named Ron Sobel. He gave a copy of Bread and Circus to Nick Turzo, who at that time was uh, also at ASCAP. And Nick was the guy who started he didn't quite randomly find it. He got handed it by Ron, but he was like, okay. this is cool. But he did just start dubbing off copies and sending them. And the next thing we knew, we had like, you know, Vicki Hamilton from Geffen, like wanting to take us out to lunch. And we're like, we never sent out any demos. <laughs> so um, it was it was kind of surprising. And uh, yeah, we hadn't, we did not think we were ready for prime time. I was uh, at that point, you know, I was going to go to San Francisco State, move up from Santa Barbara and like be a teacher. I was like wow. social sciences education was like looking at housing. And then instead we flew to New York and signed a record deal. So that's amazing. And this was obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously before the Internet. So, yes, for the kids out there, can you just share what the process was like to get your music 
out to people, radio stations, record labels? Well, people used to talk to each other. And um, it was, uh, I mean, it, it, was a, it was a strange, I don't know, it wasn't strange at the time. I mean, things in, in certain ways, it just moved a little slower. I'm, uh, it's also, I think we were really lucky to be on Columbia Records at that time. Because uh, Columbia was um, so, they were number one very well funded because it was a time where people were buying a cassette and vinyl and those new CD things. And yeah. so they were selling three formats to a lot of people. Uh, and then beyond that, there was the, uh, you know, the, they were trying to invest in new bands. You know, Columbia and part of Donnie Einer coming in there was going to build his reputation as somebody who was building career artists instead of trying to have instant hits. And so showing that he understood, you know, college music, he signed us in Poydog Pondering and uh, allowed us to re-release the first two albums completely unchanged uh, and go on tour for a few years, learn how to be a touring act. I mean... You know, and then when Fear came out, allowed us to go out there and tour for, I think, nine months before All I Want came out. And so uh, they had a patience that you wouldn't get normally. Mm. But the other thing they had was college reps in every town, uh, retail reps in every town, and radio reps in every town. So there was not a single show that we played in those years where there wasn't somebody from Columbia or Sony there to meet us, to take us out to radio stations and every day we were going to like usually two radio stations usually one in-store performance at a record store and they kind of and playing the show and doing all of that and doing press and um that the local network was what i think set them apart like we would go out with other bands and um you know gin blossoms whoever else and you know in a big market you would have the radio reps but they were there every single town when we were doing it right. um so it, it was a pretty incredible network and i mean they sent stuff there was a lot of fedex back in the day right uh, there's no email so no email to physically send talk to call on an actual phone there was calling there was faxing <laughs> there was uh yeah lots of calling lots of faxing uh lots of sending things in the mail and it just it moved at a different pace but everything got done i mean and even you know just touring you know and you'd be in the bus and you get out the atlas <laughs> and you yeah. you know plot your course <laughs> and if you're if you need to call the venue you had to pull over and find a payphone yeah. and get on the payphone and you know calling home was you know phone cards and all of that but I really oh, liked phone it. cards. I forgot about phone cards. Oh yeah, phone cards. They were they were state of the art, man. You didn't <laughs> have to have an operator to do a long distance call. Oh, it, was, it was expensive, but it was still you know better than it had been. I mean, right. I miss um, my attention to the moment that I had in those days. Mm. You know, that was mm. the thing. If you were waiting and bored, you would just like notice details. You couldn't check out. You know. Yeah. Uh, Very I mean, well said. Yeah. So I miss that too. And back then, if you were smart, you had a mailing list that people could sign up on and get actual mail. Yes. In the mail. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys had a mailing list and it was an important part of your early success. It was a huge part. And it was one of those things our management did an amazing job uh, pushing for that and getting Sony to help uh, pay for it even. We always did Christmas cards uh, and we always did like, you know, little tapes, like three song EPs or stuff that were only for the mailing list. That's cool. Um, the attitude we had, he was a deadhead and he was like trying to take it from the Grateful Dead of like, we need direct communication, snail mail list so mm. that people, you know, you go to your mail and you pick out something and it's from us to you. Um, and we always allowed taping. That was another big part of it. And that was it at the time before you could do it on the internet. Like there were these taping trees where people would find each other and dub off copies of shows and send them to yeah, each other. It was I did that. all analog, man. <laughs> and it took a lot of dedication. I, I think that's the thing about it. I remember hearing, um, you know, Pat and well, this will be patting me on the back as well, patting myself on the back. But he was talking about, you know, Toad the Wet Sprocket being an authentic uh, 
uh, authentically nerdy band, like taking the name from the Monty Python sketch, but mm. talking about how like being a nerd used to require a lot of effort. <laughs> you had to find right. other nerds. You didn't have the internet to find them. <laughs> you had yeah. to kind of search a little <laughs> farther. And, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was a little more of an, uh, an effort intensive process uh, to do a thing like a taping tree. You had to meet someone who knew someone who could get you in this thing. And, and uh, it's all happening at the speed of the US post office, right? Mm. And so the tape trading and the, you know, the keeping direct in touch with, with fans was a big thing for us. We, and we wanted that to always also be free. We never did like a paid fan club upgrade. If you were on our mailing list, you got the tapes and you got the cards and, you know, you were part of the family. I love that. And you mentioned multiple formats a few minutes ago. So this, this is my copy from 94 on CD. Nice. Um, and I have to ask because even though it's hard to believe, 30th anniversary of Dulcinea. A two-part question. One, what comes to mind? whenever you see this guy and two, what do you guys have planned for the 30th anniversary? Uh, uh, when, when that shows up, I think like, Oh my God, I have become my father. Yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am his age when, when I put out that record, which is trippy. Um, and, uh, but it's, uh, I, I mean that it's, I think probably the best, record we've made as far mm. as um, a reflection of our, our strengths, how we sound live, how, um, you know, I, I feel like our writing was in stride, uh, like my my cringe factor, you know, as, as a young person making these records, right? I was like, you know, 21 or something when, when Fear came out and, and uh, yeah, I was 23 when this came out. So it's like, wow. Some of the older songs, I'm like, ah, oh, God, how did I do that? And this one generally like, like these are decent songs. I don't mind, right. you know, <laughs> it holds up pretty well. Um, and we were, I feel like more than at any other time, we were really on the same page when we made that record. Like we were mm. a team um, to a different degree. We'd, we'd just gotten through, we'd played 300 shows for the Fear album. We were on tour for 18 months. Um, I had to have throat surgery because my throat got ripped apart. Mm -hmm. um, and like when we came in to do this, like, I don't know, it felt like there was there was a good energy happening. You know, we wanted to make, we were all on this page of like, let's make something awesome together. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I love doing that. There was another part to your question. What I are you guys going to do for the 30th oh, that. anniversary? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for the anniversary, the plan is to, um, I mean, we're hitting the road. We're going to go out with Gin Blossoms, our old friends. We toured with them Amazing. back in back in the Dulcinea days. Uh, and so doing a tour with them, Vertical Horizon is going to be the opener. Um, Very cool. Doing a bunch of shows on our own. In the fall, we're going to go out with Bare Naked Ladies and open for them. So all together, I think we're doing 60 shows this year. So great. yeah, it's going to be a good season through the summer and the fall. That's great. I, uh, I have one more question. We'll be conscious yeah. of the time that we have. I want to know if you feel lucky to have come up when you did. I think I know the answer uh, because of a couple of things you've said. Or do you think your band would have benefited from the technology or current version of the music business oh we would never exist in the current version of the music mm. business yeah it's not i mean we would have made like our local records but um i was always really ambivalent and it kind of drove the record company crazy and i've had <laughs> friends comment on it that like the idea of self-promotion or anything like i i really early knew that i wanted to make art but i didn't want to be a salesman for it I like I'm on I can be a real maven for other people's creation but when it comes to my stuff I like I'd rather make it than sell it and uh it's so the the current thing of being a digital native being really confident having a camera on you kind of pushing yourself but in that kind of effortless way I mean Billy Strings I think is the perfect example of somebody who is 
a digital native who's never cringy. It's like you see, oh, he posted something. What is it? It's him backstage playing an amazing song, sounding great, looking great, looking happy as hell, like with, you know, Madison Cunningham, like with somebody incredible. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, oh my God, it's another amazing song for Billy Strings. <laughs> And he just does it. He's always like grinning so much. And and that kind of freedom with being seen, uh, whereas we were uh, like, uh, you know, we're all kind of weird. And, uh, mm. uh, you know, the awkward. And I think part of what in the analog era um, helped people to, to come close to us is that in, in this era of bands that were all really edgy, um, we kind of stood out as being, you know, authentically nerdier and uh, authentically more awkward. And I think for a lot of people, before nerds ran the world, right? Before <laughs> the dot com era and before that, when we were just, you know, we were awkward. And um, I think a lot of people looked at that and said, oh, that's me, like all the biology majors and, then, you know, and, then, you know. Um, and so, you know, and not to say it like Soundgarden, it's like, who wouldn't want to be, you know, I wouldn't want to be the dark of Chris Fair. Cornell, yeah, but yeah. like, you know, Pearl <laughs> well, Jam and Chris <laughs> Cornell and like, oh my yeah. God, Nirvana, like that stuff was incredible. But we were, you know, I saw some quote where Todd said, we're, we're like Nirvana without a distortion box. And I, I kind of think more we were like Howard Jones with a distortion box. Yeah. So <laughs> somewhere in between the two. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't think we would have promoted. I was too shy. I would have like just made music for myself. And I, I knew early on I didn't want to push it. So we got lucky in so many ways. We got lucky to get signed because we weren't sending the music out. We'd, I already had an exit plan. Uh, and I, and even when we got signed, I was like, ah, this will last two years. It never lasts longer than that. Everybody gets dropped. So let's like have fun and they get yeah. dropped and then move on. And, and then it's become my, my life. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I don't think we would have made it. Um, and we barely, I mean, for all the self-sabotage I did and all my, you know, once again, in that brief period where it's like, you know, we're going to LA or at these big festivals. I just always felt like I didn't, I felt very outside. Didn't really feel like I even belonged in the band and then didn't feel like I belonged in that world. And it was really confusing for me. Uh, and so it's kind of amazing that I didn't, uh, that I didn't sabotage it more than I did, <laughs> mm. and, which I'm grateful for. Because <laughs> right. I mean, at this age, like I love, I love making music. I love getting to touch people. I love, you know, feeling a room, uh, all kind of feel united somehow. It's, it's an amazing thing to get to do. Uh, so that's great. Yeah. Really grateful for it, but never would have happened these days. And when young bands ask, like I, I've been asked by people like, you know, what's your advice like for making it? And I'm like, I haven't had a commercial success, uh, since night. <laughs> since 95 oh, or whatever it's like my my advice is to invent a time machine <laughs> and, yeah. and go back and you know do it when we did it uh because uh, yeah. yeah it was a, like a renaissance i'm thankful to have been a part of it just as a fan and listener of music uh but I'm yeah i'm to ask you that and that uh, your answer was Pretty incredible thanks yeah i will also say the thing about you know alternative right this this mm. they're there i mean when you hear like the people from 99x or those some of those old stations talk as well like alternative used to really be alternative because those stations would be playing they might be playing toad but then they would probably be playing uh you know i'm trying to think of who may, might be playing dinosaur jr maybe that's too far right. afield or they'd be playing you know, uh, butthole surfers, and then mm. they'd be play Soundgarden, and then they play Sarah McLachlan. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it it was a really, it really was like, if it's good, it fits, and if it's good, and it's not like specifically a country or pop or R and B record, you know, if it kind of defied the 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 genre limits of the other formats, it all fit, and they played all of it. 
and it very quickly narrowed into like more, you know, the post punk bands and there that they had their stations and there there were these ways in which it got narrowed. But that initial thing, I mean, once again, you know, Pearl Jam to Sarah McLaughlin, like back to back and nobody flinched. It all fit. No. It was pretty great. It's beautiful. Yeah. Isn't he the best? What a guy. I actually feel like I made a new friend, which is wonderful, especially when someone's had as much success as he's had, and he's still down to earth. And when we were done recording, we ended up kind of chatting, realizing we have a bunch of mutual friends. And I don't know, it's just nice when people that successful are still that down to earth. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. If so, take a look around. There's a lot of fun stuff on this channel. And I hope you'll uh, come back and check out more fun stuff like this. All right. Thanks for watching.